system here today for some reason. I had to go another direction all of a sudden. That's okay. Let's see who's here. Hello, Karen, dear. Jerry, sir, nice to see you as always. Cindy, my dear. John G., nice to see you, sir. Tony, I was thinking about you, Tony. Is it uh, you that's going to have some procedure done? Let me know if you want me. To, well, I will pray for you anyway. I think it was you uh, <clears throat> last week. Maybe it's over now and God delivered you from it, through it. I'm sure he will. Barbara, my dear, stay cool today, please. A few more days of heat. And then we'll be ready to get ready to complain about winter, right? Hey, it's too cold. And it is. Too cold, it's too hot. And yeah, all those things are true. All right, well, let's get going. Got an exciting study today. Because we're going to wrap up Noah. Before we get to Abram, Abram, <coughs> or Abraham, as they added the hay to his name. I always love that. <coughs> so uh, we're going to finish up on Noah. It's a whole class. There's so much there to teach. I want to make sure I get it all in. Uh, John or somebody give me a, a thumbs up on the sound, Karen. Just give me a thumbs up. Uh, make sure it's not doing anything bad, please. All right. With that in mind, we'll take a moment of silent prayer, as we always do. Slight sound of ocean. Yeah, you know what it is. It's all my fans. Hang on a minute. That should uh, ah, quiet it down a bit. Just fans running everywhere. <clears throat> but uh, whew, in any event, let's do a moment of silent prayer as we always do. Thank you for that, Tony. I appreciate it. Um, let's take a moment of silent prayer as we always do. It's not a salvation issue. It's a, a matter of shifting into academic mode. It's a matter of naming and citing our sins in accordance with 1 John 1, 9. Again, not for salvation, but to regain the filling of the Holy Spirit as our true mentor and our true teacher in the most important thing that we can do in life and all the other things as a Christian, serving, giving the gospel, giving, all those things are very important. But you can't do them all effectively until you learn the Word of God because that's how faith grows and without faith, it's impossible to please him so <clears throat> oh man what is going on with this sound is it all right hang on I'm gonna I'm just gonna check my connection I'm sure that's good okay I may have to <coughs> buy a new microphone it's hard to find the one that fits my my video card here it's hard to find the one that fits my all right let me know guys okay because i'm not going to monitor it in the, i'm going to have it in the background i'm not going to be able to listen to it so karen john anybody tony let me know when it goes out if it goes out please and i'll stop we'll fix it all right so we'll take a moment of silent prayer maybe that'll help Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together. We thank you for like-minded individuals who are methates of yours, those who want to study and learn, grow in your grace and in your knowledge. We also ask that you bless this ministry as we go forward, and every ministry that's teaching the word of truth. It's not a competition between any truth teaching ministry it's all on the same team and we want to glorify you father <clears throat> i ask that you bless this particular lesson and all that goes on may it first and foremost glorify you and edify the body of christ we ask that you bless this client nation as we go forward in these final days however long that is we ask that you bless all of those who are out there t preaching your word even if it is difficult and in certain areas of the world today it certainly is and we ask that you reach out 
and touch them. Anyone going through any trials, tribulations, difficulties, temptations, Father? Health issues in our congregation, I ask that you reach out and touch them personally. Give them the confidence that you are there and that you will deliver them from or through it. We ask all of that in the name of Yeshua, and it's upon his merits we do pray. <clears throat> Amen. Uh, part two, part three. I think it's just part three. It's actually part two of Noah. I love Noah's name. Hey, anybody remember what Noah means? Quickly, before I get started. Noah. Noah or Noah. Anybody remember? And that's all right. I'll give you a few seconds to get that in. Meanwhile, let's go. Uh, we're going to go to verse 7 of chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. We'll finish up Noah or Noah today. Nobody remembers Noah. Noah, what's it mean? Noah. Come on, Karen, you got this. Comfort. Comfort or rest. It's really where, if you trace it back, it's where a Shabbat uh, actually comes from. Shabbat means rest, of course. <clears throat> All right, so let's get going. Uh, boom. By faith, Noah being warned by God. Being warned by God, by the Word of God. Remember, it's not faith that warns us. Faith gives us confidence. But the Word of God is what gives us discernment and warning in life. That's why you never stop taking in the Word of God. And at the risk of, you know, whatever, if I'm not the one you're learning from, then go somewhere else. Please, find your pastor teacher. Find someone that you can learn from. And uh, if I'm him, then uh, I'm honored. But uh, in any event, by faith, Noah, being warned by God, <clears throat> And uh, the word we saw last, I think we saw it last time, uh, Cray Martizzo there. But but Cray Martizzo, I'll go back to that slide, but Cray Martizzo, I know it's a very busy slide, I apologize, but I wanted to get it all in as a catch-up to where we are. But uh, uh, Cray Martizzo, if you look up the root of it and what's used here, uh, it means that it was something learned so being warned by is really being taught by God. Personally being taught by God. About what? About the things not yet seen. What would that be? Well, in reference, that's the flood. Which, of course, hadn't happened at that point. Uh, that uh, Paul's talking about here. But about things not yet seen, the flood in obedience or reverence. In obedience, I think is good. He prepared. This is a very interesting word. Uh, it's uh, kataskuadzo. Kataskuadzo. Kata yaadzo. Um, means uh, not just prepared, but totally prepared. Built, outfitted, every, everything that was needed for the trip of which he didn't even know what was going to happen on that trip <clears throat> but um, that was uh, that was <clears throat> what that word is prepared built outfitted totally prepared an ark in the Hebrew it's a it's a cool word uh, it's a uh, Teva or Teba, um, but it, it means a box or a basket, and the same thing is in the uh, Greek. It's uh, um, oh, hang on a second. Where's that? my notes? Did, did, uh, where am I? Uh, kibatis, kibatis in the Greek. Doesn't really matter. My point is they're both the same. They both indicate a box. I got to get some air on here. Hang on. 
If there's a little sound in the background, I'm sorry. I gotta have this blowing on me. My office is like twice as hot as the rest of my house for some reason. I don't know why. Okay, so, uh, by faith, Noah, being warned by God, being taught by God about the things not yet seen, the flood, in reference here, in obedience, he prepared, totally prepared, outfitted, fitted, did everything necessary to follow the orders, to build an ark, a box, a basket. Uh, I think I showed you that last time. Same word that Moses was placed in a tava or a taba. <clears throat> it's the same word. So, to give you an idea, uh, for for what reason? For the deliverance. For the salvation, in the Greek, Paul uses uh, so, soterio, it's soteriology, it's where we get that word from. It's a study of salvation. So, therefore, what was the purpose of building the ark? To deliver. To deliver what? His household, by which, by that action, by God, he, Noah, but through the action of God, condemned the world Hello, Mary. Nice to see you, dear. By which, and we're on uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, by the way. By which he condemned the world <clears throat> and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to pistis or faith. So once again, I keep making this point because for some reason it's, it's in my head as being very important. I think you all understand it, but and Noah wasn't warned by faith. Faith doesn't warn us. He was warned by the word of God, and it says that right in verse 7. So faith doesn't warn you. But faith's important. I mean, I'm not, I'm not downplaying either one. They both are like a, a you know, a, a, uh, they're both required. Faith comes from what? The word of God. And it's the word of God that what gives us faith and strengthens our faith. So faith gives us the courage and the confidence to live in that plan of God. So here's the account. In fact, you're in Genesis. Uh, I mean, go to Genesis six. By the way, I kind of decided because I prayed about it for uh, weeks now. Really, I mean, not constantly, but but I wanted to kind of know where does God want to want me to go next up to this point it's been pretty clear <clears throat> when you start with the book of luke which i did two years ago i want you to do all the book of luke and then i want you to do the book of acts and after you do and he didn't tell me this audibly but it was pretty plain to me after i want after you set all of that up then i want you to go through every letter that paul wrote including the book of hebrews and i know there's debate on it but I want you to, to go in that order. Now, I've done that. And we're approaching the end. We won't be there for a while. But I'm kind of saying, you know, what do we do next? And I kind of been thinking about doing the book of Genesis. Uh, I've read the book, obviously. Never. I mean, I've read it at one sitting, if you will. I mean, one continuous type study a couple of times, but it's not the same as picking it apart verse by verse. So we'll see if that's where uh, God wants me to go. But I'm excited about it. But look at verse 6, I mean, verse 14 of chapter 6 of the book of Genesis. Here's the account. I'm just going to hit on some highlights here. Make for yourself a tava. Tava. Say it. Tava. And that's art. So one more word to add to your. My old friend uh, Rick Batez used to say, you know, it's our, uh, what do you call it? The uh, the thing you flip and the names go. Tells that goes. A Rolodex. A Rolodex. <clears throat> and I, I kind of liked that. That was pretty good. You don't have to be like a Greek scholar or take well, good classes, actually. Hebrew, Greek. But they do get a little tiresome. But, uh,. <clears throat> Yeah, me too, Tony. I, I, I think that's where we'll go. I don't know. For sure. But. Hey, Carlene's here. All right. Now we can get started. I'm just kidding. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, I hope uh, I hope you and Ray are doing well. 
All right. So here it is, verse 6 of the Genesis. Chapter 6, that is verse 14. Make for yourself an ark, a taba, a box, or a basket. Of what? Specifically of gopher wood. And you shall make it with some rooms, divisions, and you shall cover it. Notice, inside and out with what's translated as pitch. In the Hebrew, because this is obviously uh, Hebrew, kofar is the word. And kofar, you've seen it before. It's the covering. The, the, the word was used as the covering of the ark. The top of the ark. The covering. So, it's a covering. I'll get back to that. This is how you shall make it. And then he goes on to describe it. And people say exactly. Well, it's not exact. It's exact for someone. We assume Noah. <clears throat> 300 cubits uh, long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. And you remember a cubit was from the elbow of whoever is measuring it to the very tip of this finger. And if you measure it out, I don't have my ruler here, but somewhere between 17 and 22 inches is considered normal now, i know that's a pretty good spread there but if we took 20 inches uh, and there's no indication that noah was bigger than most or smaller than most we're not sure but if you use that uh about 20 inches for one cubit um you can figure out uh, how big it is. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, then also, you shall make a window for the ark. You shall finish it a cubit from the top and set the door, singular, the door of the ark on the side of it. And you shall make a lower second and third deck. So three decks, one door, one window. And you've seen all that before, I'm sure. But in order for Noah, listen, to build this ark out of wood the wood had to come from somewhere and back then the same as today wood came from a tree and the tree had to be cut down and the growing tree is a picture of the life of Yeshua and every time Noah cut a tree down he was illustrating the coming salvation of man which was all a part of this event and the cutting down of the tree therefore is an illustration of the cross uh, you know if you look at the uh, Septuagint um, I don't have mine with me it's it's behind this screen I'm sorry excuse me um, but somebody can look it up if you want but in Genesis uh, 6 uh, right around, uh, I don't have the verses, but where it says you shall make it out of a uh, out of um, out of a gopher wood, I think the Septuagint calls it squared timbers, and there's a whole reason for that. But it was some kind of uh, a go a good wood. Now some uh, rabbis, and I, I don't know why I always quote rabbis. I I really love their insight. Unfortunately, they're sincerely wrong about the big picture. But, but some of them say it was a, a particular kind of wood that's no longer around today. Others say it was a cedar. Others say it was pine, which has pretty much been disproven. Pine doesn't really make that great of a wood. However, whatever kind of wood it was, there was a pitch put over it, a kofar, a pitch. Now, we say that it was an asphalt or a tar. I don't know as if Noah knew how to how to uh, use petroleum products back then. I'm sure there were tar pits around maybe, you know. So who, who knows what it was. Whatever it was, and some say it was a resin of a certain tree. Whatever it was, it made the ship or the boat watertight. It, it added to its watertight integrity. It protected it. What does that sound like? 
it's the blood of Yeshua so that's the reference there so the ark was waterproofed water protected anyway covered with this pitch don't know exactly what kind of pitch it was but pretty easy to see why the Lord put it in there for us as an illustration the um, I showed you I, I said all this so let me just show it to you but the Hebrew word uh, for pitch is kofar it looks like that in the Hebrew remember the yellow there you're reading from right to left um, kofar means a covering or an atonement and uh, I think I've covered all of that already. So let's press on. Uh, also, also notice there was only one door. Most of you have seen this before. And this is to represent, just like the tabernacle, remember? There was only one way to God. That's the whole thing. There's only one way to God. There's only one door. People weren't sneaking in the back door. People weren't climbing over the rails. There was one door. And if you wanted to enter, the Bible doesn't indicate that anybody was refused entry. We don't know exactly what took place. But I would be willing to bet that the door was open for anybody. That's the representation. But there's only one way to salvation only one way to enter the holy of holies back at that tabernacle remember <clears throat> only one way to god that's through yeshua there's only one way to have fellowship with god it ain't mohammed it ain't buddha it ain't the pope it ain't your pastor it is you and yeshua how cool is that the window was built on the top it looked towards heaven it may well have been, I do believe, the way that it's written, one continuous window all the way around. So Noah would have been, when he was looking through those windows, representing the fact that he's looking up, there was nothing to see looking down from those windows. It was just water. Only thing where he needed to look was up. And there's a lesson there for us, too in the midst of our trials and tribulations and troubles and temptations and all of the things that we go through we tend to want to look at the world for solutions and god may provide the answers through the world and doctors and whatever you know what i'm saying but ultimately we need to be looking up because in the end it is his story and you're a part of it and <clears throat> what a thrill that is genesis six sixteen, make a roof for it leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around most scholars say that that is the window i mean they didn't have plexiglass they didn't have glass not that we know of anyway but remember these people lived 900 years so they they learned a couple of things right oh boy hang on one sec All right, sorry about that. Management. Management call. Who? Um, all right, so, oh, by the way, by the way, this window was open. I mean, I don't think they had glass or maybe they had some wood protection. Here's another thing I wanted to mention. Every time you see the ark in, in illustrations, no matter if it's for kids or adults, it's always in the midst of this terrible high storm. Oh, thank you. Say hi to everybody. There's the camera. Hi. Move over this way. Over me. Yep. Say hi to everybody. Hi, hi everybody. God bless. Hi, Thank you. Thank you for the water. Oh, boy. Okay. Sorry about that. I mean, I'm sure that made all kind of noise. Whew. All right. Um, oh, by the way. So, so you see, you see the, the, the arc. It's always like being tossed in like these huge waves I'm not sure that that's the way it was I mean the wa the rains came it doesn't say anything about a storm 
I think there probably were some waves going on because whatever was going on underneath the earth, the crust is, was busting open and water was flowing out. So it, it had to affect it. But I'm not sure where they get the fact, you know, every picture you see was just a terrible ride for everybody. I don't think that was the case. It wasn't that the ship was big and that was what made it ride smooth. The oceans are huge. But I, I just don't think there were storms associated with it. Um, somebody could prove me wrong, probably pretty easily, by the way, but whatever. Uh, but, well, but what's not lose sight of the obvious about this window? There had to be some ventilation, right? I mean, let's face it. So, yeah, I didn't get that, Tony, when I saw it, but you're right. At, uh, so, um, ba, 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 let's see. There was only one window, um, <clears throat> as well as one door. And the window just represents the fact that there's only one way of having fellowship with God. That is, through the gift that he has given us in the Holy Spirit. And the window way up on top, whatever it looked like, uh, looked to heaven. And that's where we should be looking as well. There were three floors, three decks. This is pretty easy to see, right? A couple of things that represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. That is the story of the universe. It's the complete story of salvation. Secondly, it represents the Trinity. And thirdly, it's simply number three, representing divinity. And there's a whole lot of in-depth study that you could do in that. I'm not sure how important it is, but you get the basics of it there. It's pretty easy to see. Now, you may say, I'm telling you, you guys are oftentimes, I'm sure, sit back and go, I, I know all that. But I want you to remember, there are people that, the people that I'm talking to here, you guys are, are advanced, all right? So, bear with me. Sometimes I have to go back because we have new people that may be joining us, and I don't want to lose them right away anyways but uh, just a thought so one door on the ark and now at one point God closes it the ark sitting there in the middle of the dry area there's no water around I mean there probably was water around that people had had found and all that but <clears throat> the rain wasn't there and it wasn't where he was the ark was up on stilts or whatever scaffolding there however God told him to do it and it's just sitting there now God says and oh and how long did it take him we know the 120 years that Genesis talks about is something some rabbis teach and I throw the rabbis out there again but some teach that it took 120 years to build Others say it, it only took five. There's a couple of references to some rabbinical writings about that. But uh, it, it took just as long as it took. <clears throat> and it was a big job, and that's going to come into play later. But in any event, at some point, God says, that's it. My patience with man has expired. I'm done. Shuts the door. All that aboard, all that was aboard, that was coming aboard, was aboard. And yet, God made him wait another seven days. One more Sabbath. One more. Uh, it's number seven representing uh, completion. So. God completely waited. That's the message. Then, God literally opens the floodgates. Now, what does the seven days represent? Well, lots of different theories, as you might imagine. One is completion. It was, he waited completely. Everybody that was going to come was given the opportunity 
So God had shut the door, but if God shut the door, God could have reopened the door. So that's one theory. Secondly, uh, it was all part of the tribulation period and that's seven years. We're not quite, there's just lots of theories on that. So let's, um, let's get back to the size for a moment. Because I, I, I want to, I'll tell you what, I, I, I did, uh, participated in a uh, debate um, about the Ark not that long ago as I was approaching chapter 11. Uh, it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one thing, it was a, 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 a group of people. But um, there were some great skeptical questions there by the, let's call them the opponents. And so I want to address them. I want to show you some things that are pretty interesting. All right. Um, Noah's Ark <clears throat> was 300 cubits long. Now, if you take an average cubit of 20 inches, I think if you work that out, you come out to around 600 feet. And that's big. Uh, I mean, an aircraft carrier is uh, about 1,100 feet, so it's a lot bigger, longer, but this is a big boat, 600 feet long, roughly. Now, some people argue that this, this by the way, I think is the one in Kentucky, and I think there's one in Indiana, I think there's one somewhere else. The Ark Experience, I don't know if it'd be worth seeing or not, kind of cool though, right? Suppose, I mean, when people say we built it to specs, you have to be, it's not true. Because you don't know what this spec exactly was. You say we built it to the specs and my cubit was the measuring thing. Well, that's different. But here's the thing. Some people argue there's no way Noah's Ark could have held two of every kind of animal. Now, I'm going to get into some advanced, well, I think it's advanced stuff here. Because I think you guys can handle it. <clears throat> you got to be very careful about some of the issues I'm going to raise, but sit back, relax. Um, so people say there's no way Noah's Ark could have held all the damn animals. Look at all the animals in the world today. But this has been thoroughly researched by both sides, those who are for and those who are against it, you know. And both sides agree. Yeah, Okay, it was plenty big enough because I can give you arguments but lots of research, lots of experts on both sides of the equation have agreed mostly that, okay, okay, if it was big enough and it was 600 feet long and, uh, you know, twice as wide as a football field is wide and that high, three decks, the animals could have fit inside. Now listen, according to my favorite subject, ninth grade math, if and experts who even have advanced math, but they work it out, the bottom line, because I'm, I'm going to move along here, but it had about as much space as depending upon the size now, between about a thousand and fourteen hundred railroad cars okay now that's maybe doesn't sound like a lot but if you hook it up it's about 12 miles long uh, if it was 1400 <clears throat> so people have calculated okay how many animals could it have held understanding that part of the space was for the eight people new beginnings by the way part was for the food they had to have a water storage system. I'll talk about it. They had to have some way of cleaning things out and whatever, trash. So, how many animals could fit? Some say 10,000. Remember, they were by pairs. Some say 40,000. If it was 1,400 rail cars, they say that it could have held about 40,000 animals, each one being roughly average the size of a small sheep. And there's a reason for choosing that. 
But here's a whole nother teaching I want to throw out to you. And I think I can with you guys without you getting distracted with it. I have taught on evolution many times. There are two factors in, in evolution. There is a microevolution. It's a micro change in species for their own adaptation. A finch may grow its beak and it may get shorter because of the dry seasons. But it doesn't change into a dog or a tree or a banana. So Satan had to corrupt the truth with a lie and that is macro evolution that we all came from green ooze so here's a thing i'll throw it out there with a very big risk of getting beat up on it but let's say now you, you say well god had to take all these cats let's just say cats well he didn't really have to take all the cats i mean this chart is not an evolutionary chart it's just an overview of what they call a species so you got the cat you put the cat includes the lion the tiger the no, not the bear but you get my point the point is guy didn't have to take let's say we're talking about well dogs if we threw in another scenario he didn't have to take you know every wiener dog all the way up to an Alaskan Muma. I don't know, I'm making that, whatever it is. I love dogs. I don't, cats are different, but uh, no, I like cats too. I got one staring at me, so. But it, uh, they're weird. But do you get my point? Does that make sense? God didn't, and Noah didn't have to find every single kind of cat. Eventually, once the ark landed, when we don't know what the pre-flood state of that species was so there's things in bio and uh it's not by bi is it biology i guess um uh, you know kind and species and genre and all those things does that make sense am i scaring anybody all right so it's not evolution as we would say evolution but that explains why it, it may not have been 40,000 different kinds of animals, including the lion, the tiger, the blah, blah, blah. Are you with me? With me on that? It's a, little, it's a little out there, I know, but it's necessary to cover this in specifics. So give me a thumbs up if you're still on board, please. I want to know. I'm waiting for one thumbs up. Just one thumbs up. Got it. Thank you, John G. Appreciate it, my friend. Let's move on. Over 200 cultures agree that there was a flood. So it pretty much proves there was a worldwide flood. People say, well, maybe it was in that area there was a flood. And then, you know, 100 years later there was one here and etc. Now, the stories all bear a tremendous similarity to the story of Noah and you can look that up I remember I was stationed in Hawaii and there was a place um, I don't remember what it was now it was a very beautiful Hawaii is very beautiful but it was a story of it was a story of the flood where slightly different scenario but basically it was the same thing anyways let's move on eight humans survived the flood don't forget Eight is the number of new beginnings. And, uh, boy, there couldn't have been a better number, all right? So, let me address a, a couple of skeptics. Thank you, Tony. Let me uh, address a couple of skeptics' favorite talking points when it comes to the flood, okay? And I just give you this as a tool for you. If it ever comes up, you need to be prepared. Always be prepared for the hope that lies within you, the confidence that lies within you. How? Well, you have to learn the Word of God. Yeah, you learn everything. You learn propitiation. You learn about soteriology, the um, difficult subjects, the fun subjects, etc. 
and I, I think this is I think they're all fun but I think this is fun uh, I love this because I, I love to take a skeptic's point of view because I want to try to get inside as a debate as a debater you, you try to get inside their head and then you can guide their thinking it's not easily done that's why the you got some really great debaters there are people out there uh, that I uh, lots of people I would not debate they're just even even if I disagree I mean they're just they're just so good at debate but in any event here's one food they say food there wasn't enough food how are they gonna get this much food for all the food required for tens of thousands of animals let's just do a little bit of an experiment figure a pound of food a day for an animal all right F forget it don't don't say well maybe it's less more let's just say it's a pound and let's say there were 5,000 animals you can easily do the math for 10 Yeah, that's exactly right, John G. You're exactly right. And that, my friend, was exactly my point by showing you that. But I, I really wanted to get it out there because uh, it explains. There's no, there's no contradiction. This is a true story. This isn't a metaphor. It's not a fable. It's not any of those things it's reality it actually happened do we know exactly things that are not in the scripture no but we can kind of fill in the blanks so hey let's get back to my my question here because i'm doing this in my head with ninth grade math skills i mean i have the numbers worked out but i'm i'm, I'm repeating it with in my head here but five thousand animals a pound a day they were on the ark for let's say 370 days it's 370 to 377 just depends on how you count a couple of things but it was over a year all right no no doubt about that if you work all that out it's about it's about 900 tons of food well, that's easily done 900 tons of food that's feasible to store okay and that you got 1400 rail cars I don't know how many it would take to make a ton, maybe maybe three tons in each one, five I don't know. It wouldn't it's not that it's not impossible. Now, some would say it took Noah 120 years, so he could have easily gathered all of that. Or it may have taken five. Either way, he could have gathered the food. That's not really much of a, an argument. And also remember a couple of things. One, this is God's plan. God's going to make it work. All right, so, but I, I don't think we always need to say, well, God said it, so he just did it. God does give us reality that we can convince others of his reality. I don't know if that made sense, but it came out that way. So, Secondly, but uh, there's a bunch of things here. Uh, secondly, God would have not had, like, let's just take elephants, okay? God wouldn't have made two huge five and a half ton elephants be the two. It probably would have been younger adolescent elephants. No longer needing the mother or the father, the mother for, for food or for milk or do they do milk? I don't know. Anyway, whatever. You, you get my point is the species would have been taken from the younger side, not the older side. So that would have cut down on the food immensely. Thirdly, uh, whatever food was gathered, the atmosphere of the earth was much different then, much more oxygen rich. It's like being in a hyperbaric chamber. If I've ever seen those, I want one in my, I want one right here, right? Because they're supposed to be great for healing and all of that. Sports people do it all the time. Uh, raw, you know, 
movie stars, rock stars, and probably presidents, whatever. Who you know, everybody in that club, right? That you ain't in, and thank God we're not in it, anyways, for the most part. But so that's number three. What's number four? Um, can't remember number four. Uh, oh, so 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 the oxygen-rich environment, things wouldn't have rotted. They would have sat there. It's you know we we put an uh, we put an apple out, and eventually it just within a month, right? It it would probably within a week. I don't know, depending upon the temperature and all that. Back then, it was all still within that canopy that was over the earth, so food probably lasted as long you know what would be equivalent it'd be like a big mac right you take a big mac and put it out it'll be there six months later try it it's amazing uh, it won't taste good but then again it never did uh, but but that's the the point is the food would have lasted a lot longer in that environment would have been cut down because of the animals being of the younger variety still being able to uh, procreate later no births, no deaths on the ark. No births, no deaths on the ark. I can prove that uh, by scripture, but it's also pretty widely accepted. And then thirdly, I just had it. Uh, oh, God probably, probably put them into some sort of hibernation status. He just laying around on a rocking boat would have, I mean, they're not running out in the wild. They're not expending a lot of energy so all those things combined for the food aspect okay and I can make those arguments much better but that should suffice all right secondly how the animals get to the ark how did kangaroo get to the ark well that's pretty easy actually because before the flood most of the earth was land and if you drain the oceans you'll see the land bridges were everywhere I'm not a geologist I think that's the person that would be referenced here but <clears throat> that's a, another a pretty easy one so before the flood the earth most of it was land after the worldwide flood, 70% of the earth now is, of course, water. But a lot of that water, if you look uh, at charts, that water's not that deep in many places. I mean, it might be 50 to 100 feet deep in places. If you were just to remove that little bit as the rains receded, they filled in places, right? It's a long subject, but the bottom line is how the animals get to the ark, they walk there, all right? If it took 120 years for God to make the call, or whether it took five years, five years is a long time. So the animals got there, I know that, because God said, I will bring them to you, Noah. You don't have to be a hunter. You don't have to be a trapper. You don't have to learn how to play the flute and go out and play it and they'll all follow you back. You don't have to do that. I will bring them to your door at the right time. And I believe that they all came within a certain window of time. And people go, well, how's that happen? And I go, uh, God did it. And they said, well, that's not fair. You can't answer a question like that. And I say, well, then your answer is that it all came from green ooze. How'd that happen? And they say, it just happened. And then, for some reason, I lose the argument? No, I don't think so. Let's move on. Water. What about water? We need water. Well, <laughs> there was plenty of water. Water was everywhere. And unlike the, I think there's a, a, a sailor's poem, you know, the worst thing, being stuck on a lifeboat in the middle of the ocean. Is you water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. I don't know where that comes from, but but it's true. You can't drink that water, not even a little. And many a sailor has found out the hard way. 
the terrible pain that that causes. But in, in any event, there was plenty of water. No one would dispute that, right? I mean, you could be the idiot to dispute that. How would they capture it? Well, they captured water prior. I know it didn't rain, and I, I know there, we don't know for sure whether there were brooks and, I mean, uh, springs and things like that. There probably were. But the bottom line is it wouldn't take Noah, who, who was six, he was between, what was he, 600 years old here? He learned a few things. Secondly, God was in control. And some, so there were plenty of water. There was plenty of water. And by the way, at that point, because there hadn't been a lot of wash off, the seas were probably not very salty yet. Right now, what are they, 4% or something like that? I can't remember. Uh, my biology, sociology, mathology, I don't know what the hellology it was, but something like that. But if there's a little salinity, enough that we can't drink it, but again, uh, the water coming up from within the earth wouldn't have been salty, we don't think. There's arguments there, I'm sure. But there was plenty of water. And then you had the rain. And the rains were falling, and it wouldn't take Noah too long to figure out there's rain. I, if I have it go into something, I'll have water. Noah is a little smarter than that. What about the plant life? When did it all die? A couple of things. One, and I'm going to get to the other one later, but one, plants live in the ocean all the time. I mean, in fact, do you know that we get more oxygen in the, in the exchange of carbon dioxide? We get more oxygen from the oceans than we do from all the trees in the world? Look it up. Fact upon fact upon fact. Waiting one day for you to be on Jeopardy going they don't have my column up there damn it that would be, that's probably what would happen to me but the plant life uh, that's pretty easy by the way I mean plants live in floods all the time 40 days is nothing the, the, the waters recede the plants are still there many cases some obviously don't survive but most do so it's believed that many places on earth the plants survived and here's another thing that uh, I, I heard a, uh, a preacher throw into the comments section on this debate was um, hey God created it all once I mean how hard would it be for him to create it again it's not like he forgot how so keep that in mind also, as I said, the entire atmosphere, that's a great study, by the way, uh, the entire uh, atmosphere, there was more oxygen, um, it was under this canopy of ice, perhaps, many of us believe, seagrass and kelp, kelp is where it all comes from, Tony, you know, and there are such these huge, uh, these huge, w w we call them kelp farms, They're, some are probably commercial, but way out uh, in the middle of the ocean, they're just naturally growing. And they're so thick that the Navy tracks them. But we don't want to run through them. It's not that we get stuck or anything. It's just that it would clog things up. Because they go down 12, 15, 30 feet. I mean, they're huge. So absolutely. And Cindy, you're right on. The olive trees survived the floods. Yes. Good job, everybody getting through that um, and okay so Noah brought along enough food and it lasted a long time Genesis 6 uh, 21 I'm gonna jump around here a little bit because as you can see when I was filling this out the last couple of days I was jumping around but you shall take for yourself what a little bit of food no all and gather it and it'll be food for you and them and people say well what about those uh, lions they want to eat the the bear or the whatever 
um, this will probably blow you away, but they were all not carnivorous at that time. They were all not, they were all uh, vegetarian. Uh, that's a whole other argument. Boy, getting into some really dicey territory, huh? But, all right, so we could uh, debate about how many animals were actually on there. But it's been said that uh, about 10,000 animals the size of a, of a young sheep would have taken up about one-third of one deck of the ark. I'm sorry, one-third of the ark, which would be one deck of the ark. So one deck for the animals, one deck for the food. There's plenty of room. Uh, there's a theory. Uh, I, I don't even think it's really uh, a conspiracy or anything. But uh, most rabbis adhere to this. I know I keep throwing them out because they're recent in my... There were many in this debate thing. But uh, they say that... Uh, before the flood, people were vegetarians. I know, I know Abel did an animal, but it doesn't say that he ate the animal. Uh, I'm not saying they did or didn't, for sure. I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, and here's why. I mean, I, so when I, when I heard that, and he threw out a couple of references, uh, I went back and looked at them, which you should always do, by the way. Never just sit there and take anybody's word for this stuff. Go and look it up yourselves, if you have time. And then once you trust somebody, then of course it's different. But Genesis 1.29 says, And God said, See, look, behold, I've given you every herb that yields a seed, and every tree whose fruits you shall eat it for your food. Now, after the flood in Genesis 9, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things. Just as I gave you all the herbs, I've given you all the other food. And many believe that is a reference to uh, meat, animals. Okay, let's move on. Blah. And I'm, I'm just kind of jumping around on some subjects as I was building this. Um, I wanted to get the facts in here. So, the Bible tells us where the ark landed. Well, sort of. I can't really say it tells us specific... Well, according to Scripture, uh, in Genesis 8, the ark came to rest on the mountains of, uh, of Ariat. It's an area today in Turkey. Now, it's not on top. It doesn't say it landed on top of the mountain. That's pretty hard to do, and it'd be pretty easy to see. Um... Not, not that that was a factor, but it landed somewhere on the side of the mountain. In Turkey, there's also uh, an area in uh, Armenia and some other places. But let's stick with Ariat here, being in Turkey. Many expeditions have searched for it, and on your right there is a what was thought for many years to be the ark it's uh, way 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 too big but uh, it's not but uh, I just throw that out there because there are many many theories in all of that references to the sighting of the ark go all the way back I love the fact that as I was doing the research for this class just adding up some things uh, I came across and it it struck me because uh, my son has a pool and my grandson and I and he would lo love to play M Marco Polo, you know. And uh, Marco Polo said, I found it. He said in the heart of the Armenian mountain range, which is nearby, there is near the peak Noah's Ark. So I know what you're thinking, perhaps, is it still there? Is it still wherever it landed? Well, probably because this pitch was a protector 
So it probably survived to one degree or another. Now, I didn't, I told you that picture I showed you, this pretty much been debunked, but there are others, uh, and you know, that, that look like the Ark. Turkey doesn't allow many expeditions in. Someday, I do believe God, if he wants us to find it, he'll show it to us, and he'll show it to the world. I think the Ark of the Covenant will be found. I think he'll show that to the world, and it'll all be a part of the embarrassment to the Jewish nation that rejected Yeshua. God said, I gave you so many signs, and you rejected them. That's, and therefore, I had to bring in the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are going to be the ones to guide you. Noah didn't know how all this was going to work out. He built the ark. We just saw the end of that ex expedition of his, if you will. But he didn't know how it was all going to work out. But he was confident that it would. I mean, think of the thing. You've seen it before. It's it's in the middle of a dry area. There's, there's never been rain before. Doesn't even know what a boat is, although maybe they built it to travel on lakes or rivers, whatever. Uh, I don't know. Um, but, but in any event, build this thing, and here's how big it's going to be. And Noah had to be going, uh, but, but that's pretty big. I got this, I got that. But he had to be able to figure, he was, he was 600 years old, so probably had a little bit of math, more than I. He probably got it just like that. So we're going to need a big boat. But he got the big boat. He didn't know how it was going to turn out. Starts raining, water bubbling up. The seas are carrying him higher and higher off the earth in the act of deliverance. Does that remind you of? The whole thing is about Yeshua, obviously. He didn't know how it was going to turn out. And and I don't hasten. Well, I, I don't rush to tell you, look, look, you know, I, I don't say, look, Noah didn't know what was going on. And it's the same in your life. I'm not comparing the two. But I kind of am because we all have our own arc, if you will, right? It's our own mission, whatever it is. And people go, well, I can't, I didn't get a big mission. God didn't tell me to build an ark. No, but he gave you a family, you know. He, he gave you grandchildren. You're to be a legacy to them. He gave you the eyes to read doctrine, the ears to hear it. The mouth to repeat it. I mean, don't don't be looking for a big mission in your eyes, because every mission is big in God's eyes, no matter what it is. Noah had a great mission, no doubt. So do you, so do I, and we got to realize that. Once we do, your life should change. It really, really should. So, at the time that Noah gave, we got his command from God. No, I've never seen anything like that before. He had, there was no, you know, and we always look around for the evidence, right? You know, God said, look, there's going to be a flood on the earth. You're going to build a boat. And I'm sure he told him many details. And Noah, just being human, looked around and goes, I don't see, right, there's dirt, dry, dust, I don't, I don't see how it's going to work out, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it exactly like God tells me. Because I don't know, but he does. And, boy, I don't know. I don't know. I can't wait to meet Noah. I, I bet you Noah's excited. And he spread that excitement to his family. That's the way I see it anyway. So there are times when you would agree with me I'm sure we don't know how things are going to turn out and that causes stress and it causes worry if we allow it to but we're commanded not to allow that and I you know everything that Paul quoted about that we got from Isaiah Isaiah said fear not I'm with you I'm your God what I can just imagine. Go. What more do you want? I am your God. You are my people. 
I'm not saying life is easy. I'm not saying that. So, all right. No is referred to here as an heir of righteousness. I talked about that before. Very important line. But you know, obedience to God is tied to the concept of an inheritance. Remember the Exodus crowd; they didn't get the full inheritance because they didn't have total obedience to God. Even Joshua failed. But the point is, we we too have an, uh, that inheritance. Paul talked about that in this very book that he was writing to these Hebrews. And yes, faith was what it's all about, Tony. Because without it, it's impossible to please God. You see, but I give, doesn't matter. Giving's great. I serve, serving's great. But I have no faith. Well, then you're not pleasing God. Because the people that we've seen so far, we saw Enoch, we saw Abel, we saw Noah, and we're going to see Abraham. How did they please God? And every one of them did. They walked with him. They pleased him because they had faith. So let me go back to Genesis 6. I told them to bounce around a little bit. But it just proves my point that I've said before. One man or a woman willing to obey God can change the course of his story, which is history. History is his story, and we're a part of it. And we're willing to obey God exactly. We can change the course of history. So, in Genesis 6, uh, he's told, Noah's told what, what to bring in verses 19 to 22. Two of every kind of bird, two of every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground, They'll come to you to be kept alive. That's, you know, you know if, if you get around forest fires and things, the animals still react that way. They still come down, almost like they're coming down to man to be saved. Just an aside. But uh, you're to take every kind of food. And Noah, look, Noah did everything. And that Hebrew word means to the smallest detail, just as God commanded him. So, you notice the animals came to Noah. He didn't go out, didn't trap them. I said this earlier. He wasn't a Pied Piper. He guided him. God guided him right to the ark at the proper time. And so animals could walk to the ark. I proved that already, or I mentioned that already. Take with you in verse uh, 2 of chapter 7. Jumping ahead a little bit. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal. A male, and, and if your translation says it's mate, boy, I just cringe at that. And then two of every kind of unclean animal. So seven of every kind of clean animal and two of every kind of unclean animal. A male and its mate. And that's ridiculous because if you look it up in the Hebrew, it's ish and isha, it's it's what where we get man and woman, but it's really male female. So I heard one. Uh, I won't even go where I. One person was talking about which is totally ridiculous. Uh, people are so stupid. But people would look at me that way too. So sorry, I digress. You know what? I blame it on the COVID. Right? It's like, oh, yeah, before I got COVID, I didn't have that. Now I got that. So we gained a little. Ah, before I had COVID. You never rely. Ah, it was before. I... All right, so in uh, the, the Hebrew Bible, or the, the in the Hebrew, it says, take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal and seven pairs of uh, the, clean, uh, the, the clean animals to keep their various kinds alive. Now, we know that Leviticus 11 defines the difference between clean and unclean animals. However, Noah lived, of course, way before that time. We're not told how he knew which animals were clean and unclean, but he did. And it's probably not a stretch, because Moses, when he wrote Leviticus 11, was writing from his perspective but God told him the history. 
So he wasn't around for Genesis, and yet he wrote Genesis. So God had to fill him in on a lot of e detail. So the bottom line is no one knew. So also, also, as we pointed out, sacrifices were made to God prior. Uh, we know that Abel did it, for example. We already talked about that. So God had communicated that. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I'll show you. Uh, clean animals, that's what they are. Um, they chew their cut. Uh, which is a whole weird thing, but um, they have a divided hoof, certain birds, chickens, doves, duck, duck. And for those of you who love those things, the grasshoppers and the, the locusts, not my favorite. Did try one once somewhere, a uh, grasshopper. And then there was a chocolate covered grasshopper, and uh, I think at that point I sobered up. Back in my drinking days, I'm kidding. Pretty much, um, and then you had the unclean animals. Blah blah blah. Of course, you notice pigs are in that. Uh, so anyway, specifically, a couple different reasons for all that, and that's a whole another study. I don't really want to get into that study. I have studied Leviticus, um, but here's the thing: the New Testament in where? Where is it at? That says that uh, we can eat. Uh, uh, there's no judging about the food that we eat. Paul Paul said it. We read it. It's in Colossians 2. But Paul also said, look, you know, you go to a Jewish person's home. You don't bring shellfish. All right? It's... And you don't bring pig. You don't bring bacon. And most of the, the clean, unclean animals dealt with health issues. Um, as well, and you can really look into that in depth. Just no matter where you look, bacon is just not a clean food, kosher. And I like bacon. Probably not good for you. I understand that. But... Verse 7, or verse 16 of chapter 7, book of Genesis. And they entered the ark. Male and female, <clears throat> every living thing that God had commanded Noah, he brought in, and then God shut the door. Notice, God shut them in. There was no way Noah could open the door. There was no way Noah could shut the door. How exactly was all that worked out? I don't know. But then the rains came, and they came from the sky and from the underground springs, as you know. Verse 17, the floods came for 40 days. Though listen, the water increased. And what did it do to the ark, which is a type of Christ, who's going to deliver mankind from the judgment? It rose off of the earth. He'll be lifted up above the earth. Remember, this is a clear illustration of Yeshua. The whole thing is, but... Verse 19, the water got higher and higher. The mountains were covered, plus 15 cubits. And the mountains were covered. All the flesh, in verse 21, that moved, perished, that was on the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, every swarming thing, and all of mankind. And the waters were there. Now, it doesn't say this there, but if you take it in context and, and look at the rest, it, the water remained there for 150 days. Then, God remembers Noah. It's not like God forgot and goes, Oh, jeez. I better go get those guys. No, it means that now God was in the plan. The next part of his plan was to get them off of the ark so a new beginning could take place. In Genesis chapter 8, great verse, The Lord causes a wind. The Hebrew word for wind is ruach. Try it. Ruach. It's a beautiful word. I love it. It's the same as in Genesis 3 8, when it says that God came wa and the Lord came walking in the cool of the day. The cool of the day was his breath, it was a wind. He came in the wind. You know what he did? I love this. He came and the wind just was there. It wasn't. He just came in the wind. It's such a, such a great term. 
and he uses and and ruach also uh, refers to his breath the breath of god so god brings his spirit and it dries the earth so the ark had set sail now it's landed and when did it land look at verse 4 of chapter 8 of genesis on the seventeenth day of the seventh month the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ariat. Once again, the word of God gives a specific date, and that's always should pique your interest. Pique it. The seventeenth day of the seventh month. Well, on the seventeenth day of the second month the rains came. So now on the seventeenth day of the seventh month, the ark landed. Where we get the hundred and 50 days but 150 days between those two but here's the question uh, boy, I got all those doubles why sorry bouncing back why would the Holy Spirit tell us that well you, you know that when the Holy Spirit gives us that kind of detail it just might be kind of important so in order to get this we got to remember the Jews had two calendars okay the original, I've gone through this before, so I'm going to do it quickly, just bear with me. The original is what we call now their civil calendar. It begins at Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, the new year, it's in the fall. It's the month of Tishri. Oh, man. Now, under the new religious calendar, that God started with Moses during the Exodus, Tishri becomes the seventh month. Nisan, which was under the old calendar, the seventh month, God says, that's going to be your first month. Nisan 5th, 14th, that's going to be the Passover. So that's going to be the religious calendar. All right? So let me show you. Maybe this is a little bit better picture. Nisan up at the top was the first month in the new calendar, the seventh month in the old. Down at the bottom, Tishri was the first of the old calendar, but the seventh of the new. So from the old calendar, you go seven months, uh, and you'll arrive at Nisan. So all of that, I can go into greater detail for you, but that's really not all my point. But in Exodus 12... God institutes the Passover, which is in the month of Nisan. All right, so under this old calendar, the month of Nisan is also called the month of Abib later, but it's the seventh month, okay? It's the first under the new, but back when it's being talked about in Genesis, it's under the old. So it's the... Um, it's the... Uh, uh, Nisan was the seventh month back then, okay? Um, it was the first month back then, the seventh month under the new. But here's the thing. A, a few things happened on the Nisan 17th. We know one already that should be in your head because I just mentioned it. But here's a, just a couple of examples of Nisan the 17th. Remember, it's the same date, all right? The calendar changed. That's... That was my whole point there. But the Israelites, they crossed over the Red Sea on the 17th day of Nisan. On the 17th of Nisan, the Lord stopped providing the manna. And they were, for the first time, eating the fruit of the promised land. And these are just three, right? Here's a biggie. Yeshua was in the tomb on what day? Nisan 14th, full moon, Passover. Three days, three nights later, my math. It's ninth grade as it is. He rose as our great high priest on the 17th day of the 7th month. So, very important, these dates that the Holy Spirit puts out, sometimes not quite so easy to understand, but that's my job, and other people, and uh, smart people have figured that out. What do you think? All right? Anybody still awake? Because I'm not done. Um, let's skip a little bit. Oh boy.
Dang, 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 dang. I don't want to do that. So, the water recedes. And at the end of 150 days, the water has gone down. And on the 17th day of the 7th month, the ark is on that uh, Mount Ariat. The waters continue to recede till the 10th month. If you add all that up, and I don't know if I... I, I don't really want to show this. Nah, I won't. Uh, I, I have a graph that I built, but I want to make sure it's set out properly. Bef well, uh, maybe I'll show you. I, I don't know. Let me see. Um, but it continues to recede. If you add it all up, it's a, it's between 370 and 377 days, depending upon the first seven where Noah was in the ark, and there's some debate on that. But it's over a year that he's on the ark, okay? Um, now, they're on the mount. Mount Arya. I told you, for 40s run wild in the Bible for various reasons. I, I do have a study on 40 days to do with you one day. <clears throat> I was going to teach it a few months ago, but I didn't. But uh, in verse 8, or verse 6 of chapter 8 of Genesis, after 40 days, Noah sends out a raven. And the raven went back and forth. So somebody said it was the raven that dried up the earth. No, the raven had nothing to do with drying up the earth. The raven went forth and he kept on going until the earth dried because the raven is an unclean bird. The raven is a scavenger. The raven feeds off of dead flesh. So the raven didn't return. So he either died or there's dead flesh out there floating around, whatever. I don't want to paint the picture of what things had to look like. Couldn't have been very pretty in many ways and areas. Noah lets... And, and ravens will eat almost anything, by the way. Uh, God has used them for good things. It was Elijah, I know. You're going to say, well, the raven was... Yeah, well, God can use evil for his good. And that's what he did with the raven. But, Noah, but uh, Elijah never ate the raven. They just brought him food story for another day but no less another seven days pass sends out a dove the dove comes back so no one knows something's not right the, the the dove had nowhere to land good seven more days notice every seven it's on a sabbath every seven he sends out another dove it comes back with a piece of olive branch cindy you mentioned the olive tree um, got, looks like you got inside my head. Not a good place to be. To get out. But Noah lets another seven days pass. And it comes back with the olive leaf. Then he sends out a dove seven days later. And it doesn't return. So he knows. He knows he's about to hear those words. That he wants to hear so bad. Noah. Get out of the ark. So couple of points as I close here this is my little chart I'm working on um, but I, I, I don't want to get into it right now but you know the 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 raven was an unclean bird considered to be a symbol of evil throughout many cultures the dove is a clean bird and in scripture it's a symbol of course of the Holy Spirit so you notice characteristics of the raven. The raven went back and forth and it never came back. Who else in, in, in scripture did comes to your mind when you talk about uh, going fro to and fro? Uh, Satan, right? Satan was said to go, be upon the earth going back and forth, looking for those that he can devour. So it reminds us, I thought, of the unbeliever you know they don't know God nor the things of God so as a result they go through life rather aimlessly deriving futile pleasures from things that have no life eternally speaking in them now the raven was point uh, was sent out only once the doves, or dove, was sent out three times. So many point out 
the number three. There's a lot of threes here. Noah had three sons, three wives. Yeshua raised on the third day. I went through some of that. But back to the raven. In, in comparing the raven with the dove, the raven was able to derive his satisfaction from the dead flesh, the fleshly things of the world. The dove wasn't able to do that, so it returned to Noah, who had sent it. When the dove came back a second time, it had an olive branch or a leaf in its beak. You know, you know Christianity, and Cindy pointed this out Christ, I mean, in her way there by mentioning it, Christianity, Judaism, even Islam, all agree the olive tree symbolizes peace. And olives themselves have been known throughout history to have a very nutritional and, I mean, it's still a health food, right? I mean, you can, you can go buy the regular olive oil from the from Stop and Shop, or you can order this particularly hand-pressed whatever, whatever, from Greece and pay like 50 bucks a bottle both olive oil, I don't know if there's any difference, but olive oil has played a significant role, right, in the Bible. It was used to appoint kings, used to light the menorah in the temple, um, all of those things. In fact, uh, this is the uh, emblem of the state of Israel. It's not their flag, but it's the emblem. And if you notice uh, the olive leaves going around it there in the menorah the Mount of Olives well Gethsemane Gethsemane means the crushing place of olives so the Lord was crushed there for uh, yeah is that what it is John one is single pressed better quality You know, when I get on various health kicks, one of them is to take a little spoonful of olive oil every day. And I actually develop quite a good taste for it. It's just one very expensive kind. But in any event, uh, let's move on. I want to close. God told Noah the words I'm sure he was waiting to hear. Noah, come out of that ark, you and your wife and your sons and your wives. And bring out all those creatures so that they can increase. And multiply so nothing was born on the ark I told you that before and nothing died and we're pretty sure of that so the first thing that Noah did was to build an altar and then he sacrificed for the first time there in chapter 9 uh, or chapter 8 uh, where are we I think we're in uh, 9 now somewhere in there but the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma he said never again am I gonna make this happen uh, talking about the flood and that's how we end up with uh, we are at nine. The, with the ark now. Before I go, uh, by the way, um, we can't leave Noah uh, without mentioning what theologians call the shame of Noah. I don't want to leave it, but this is where I will close. I promise. Only a few pages left in my notes, which could be ten minutes or an hour I don't know I don't care I don't even have a clock I do it's right there but uh, we can't leave Noah without just a mention of it well, and I know I'm going to get into this deeper when we get into Genesis but look at verse 9 or chapter 9 of Genesis and look at verse 20 excuse me a moment let me show you the so in verse 20 of chapter 9 of Genesis Noah is a man of the soil. He's a farmer. And he proceeded to plant a vineyard. Now, a couple of things. He had these seeds that he took from the pre-flood into the post-flood world. So, I'm not saying they were magic beans, but they were different than what you and I could get today. I would love to get them. I bet you they grew fast. I bet you they, I bet you they grew good. Uh, the best. And Noah had those seeds. 
he was commanded to take him. So he takes from for the grapes. Now we get, we take quite a jump here. He plants a vineyard. Somehow he knew about wine. Although this is the first mentioned principle. It's the first time wine is mentioned. Yayin in the Hebrew. It's the first time you can look it up. So he plants a vineyard and he drank some of it and he became drunk and he lay uncovered in his tent. Now some rabbis teach back to rabbis but some rabbis teach that this took the the, the vineyard grew within 30 days. Some say it grew in a day. I think that's a bit ambitious but these were supernatural seeds as were all the seeds that Noah had which explains why the food was replenished very quickly and remember we're still under uh, the the old environment to some degree so everything was better I guess you would say so food is available very quickly but back to Yayin this is the first mentioned principle of Yayin Yayin in the Hebrew means alcohol it's from fermented grapes specifically but any kind of alcohol I don't know what other kinds there would have been but but isn't this interesting you know under the first mentioned principle wine doesn't have a very good beginning does it now now wine's not the problem man is okay some can drink a little and enjoy the fruits and it's intended that way others cannot and they just have to be man enough or woman enough to admit it they have a weakness it's okay they don't want to they don't want to work on on drinking more you know they just under want to understand it it's not a sin to drink but it's a sin to let that drink take over one's behavior okay so this is the first time wine is mentioned some teach that Noah discovered it completely by accident I didn't know oh this is pretty good I don't I reject that I think he knew about it uh, I don't do that to defend Noah but we recognize one thing okay <clears throat> Moses wrote this and he didn't spend a lot of time on Noah's problem so he focuses on another issue that's been highly debated and we don't know I mean I think I know just from what I've learned but Ham Ham was the youngest of the three sons of Noah with Shem being first where we get Shemite from Semite the Jew then we get uh, Yapath or Jepheth in some way in some point Ham becomes evil now some have suggested various types of evil that took place within Noah's tent the behavior inside of Noah's tent is ara in the Hebrew and it can mean a variety of things including sexual sin uh, I will throw that out there but the way Moses records the incident with minimum details is kind of strange if it were well well you know what to have written any more might have been even worse but in any event let's leave that uh, Ham sees his father naked drunk passed out fully on display as it were now at this point only Ham knows what Noah has done gotten drunk what was the right thing for 
ham to do. And I'm not going to get into ham and all of his descendants and all that. We might have to do that to some degree. I haven't decided. But let's just stick to the story. What's the right thing that Ham should have done? Well, I guess there are a couple of options. But I do believe the best thing that he could have done was perhaps to just turn and walk away and never mention it to anyone. The doctrine of privacy, we call it. Or he could have discreetly grabbed a cloak that Noah had removed and covered him with it. Noah would have known then perhaps, maybe not, maybe Noah doesn't remember anything. But look at verse 22 of chapter 9 of Genesis, Ham, the father of Canaan. So Canaan's already been born by this time. How old he was, we don't know. Saw his father naked told his two brothers outside. So Ham runs out to tell his two brothers. Whatever the failing of Noah, he was inside of his own tent. Question, where was his wife? Some, by the way, teach that Ham had sex with his mother. I think that's absurd, not because it would shock me in the Bible, but the way that it's written, I don't see how anyone could get that. But I throw it out there for you. So, here's what I will close with. Shem and Japheth honored privacy. Ham did not. Ham not only entered the tent, but violated the principle, and then he didn't assist his father but in fact embarrassed his father. He did nothing to preserve the dignity. He didn't see to it that Noah was properly covered. He went out and he told. You know what that word told is? Because this is where your mind should be going. I wonder what, what that word means. Well, it's easy. Uh, to, you'll spot it. It's nagad. And nagad is the same word that God used when he said, Who told you you were naked? And so what does that mean? It means that he told it in, a, in an enticing way to change a behavior. That's what he went out to tell the youngs, the, uh, his brothers. Our dad's there. He's naked. You've got to come and see this. This is incredible. I don't know exactly. Now, there are a couple of other theories that I think are wrong, equally as wrong. One, that Ham had some sort of sexual relationship with Noah and then there's a weird one that rabbis put forth that says that Ham castrated his father which explains why he had no more children uh, again I don't see that I think no matter how well I don't want to say I've been really drunk before but I don't think I've ever been drunk enough that people would be castrating me and I didn't know it but that's just me anyway whatever this failing was of Noah which I think was as simple as getting drunk and being naked it wasn't even Noah it was Ham who embarrassed his father now some people say the cursing of Canaan wouldn't have came from just that so there had to be something else well I don't know if that's true or not why is that God knew as prophetically God knew that Canaan was going to be evil so I don't think it was any of those other things anyway uh, Jephthah and Shem went to great lengths not to see their father and I think that's pretty impressive. Taking that garment that <laughs> Noah should have still been wearing. And they walked backwards and you know the story. Uh, now here's the thing though. When Noah awoke from his drunkenness, he knew what had happened. I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. 
nobody does, but was it because he knew he remembered a little? I don't know. Regardless of the source, uh, Canaan, the first one born, by the way, uh, after the flood, was cursed, at least that we were told about. So I think Noah uh, saw by prophecy the moral flaws that Ham exhibited, that his son Canaan would exhibit, and therefore cursed that uh, Canaan. So, with that, we are done. That's it for Noah. Uh, I'll get back to that story again. What do you think? Any thoughts on that? There are lots of different theories on what Noah did, what the uh, ham did. I've given you a few of them. Some are uh, some are better defended than others, I'll say that. Um, but any event, anybody, anybody got anything before we close? Nothing. All right. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed it. And if there's nothing else, we'll just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we gathered together. We thank you for those who are like minded. We ask you to bless all of our congregation as we go forward. Bring us back together on Tuesday so we can study your word. We thank you for all those who are like-minded and ask your blessings be upon this ministry and all ministries teaching the word of truth. We thank you, Father, for everything and we ask it all in the name of